is well like we have heard in the opening prayer here we go and we are having our daily bread and uh, as you know these past sabbaths we have been going over the most basic bible doctrines that we have all in writing that will be like a handbook in writing just you know for all christians to really have something to they can rely upon but we, we we've been going through all these things because there are many people listening to us and uh, there are many people who need to restore or for in some cases for the first time really read for the first time really understand the basic doctrines you know the doctrines like you know why is there god what is god who is god uh, the doctrines, why is the why is Satan? Who is Satan? What is the role of Satan in today's world? The doctrine, like what is the kingdom of God? The doctrine, like you know, who what is man? You see, in the last several Sabbaths, we have covered the topics of uh, what is death, what is redemption, what is conversion, what is baptism. Uh, in other words, we already uh, covered the topics of why was God, why was God there creating man and creating human family. And in a sense, yes, there is one wonderful book that Mr. Armstrong wrote, and uh, perhaps it's, uh, it's not perhaps, but surely it is much needed to be read by all various Christians around the world, and that is the incredible human potential. You see, many people are just totally unaware, and the educational system of our countries and the overall uh, stance of the world is just so much against God that uh, uh, it certainly never teaches never teaches anything related to God and related to his purpose of our human lives. So today I decided to cover with all of you one of those basic doctrines is what is man? You know, what is man? What, 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 you know, we already talked about the human number one enemy and that's the death. But now what is a, what is man? Why, you know, why, why God created man? Yes, we know. But what is man as a man? What is man with his temporary physical, physiochemical life? And uh, again, related to that would be that, you know, humans have been created for a very glorious purpose. And uh, that purpose is well explained in very, I would say, very simple language in incredible human potential. So uh, we will, we, I do have it in a PDF format and I would very, very highly encourage you and not only you, but everyone else who wants to serve God to review that doctrine because it is stupendous it is it is it is amazing you know it's uh, it's so beyond human even comprehension today of course because satan is doing his work but it's also beyond any human imagination humans could never imagine that they could become you know because we're all brought up in societies that tell us that we are not worthy of serving god we're not worthy of being close to god we're not worthy of of praying even by ourselves we always need to have some spiritual guides you know from of course from the normal christianity that's how they teach people here uh, and the Orthodox and Catholic churches, they teach their, mem their members or the people of that faith that they're not even to read the Bible because they cannot understand the Bible. They should not be reading the Bible. They should be reading the biography of all their saints. However, still the question remains. as a big mystery to the large segments of humanity. What is man? You see, there was a man called John Merrick, he was so-called elephant man. He was called this because he was sadly deformed by a physical debility that twisted his features to loosely resemble the creature of an elephant. And uh, at one point he just exclaimed, I'm not an animal, I'm a human being. And yes, you know, he knew that he was not an animal, but these days evolutionists are not so sure. They believe that we are all animals, more descendants of primitive life forms, that also spawned the apes and other creatures on this earth by the process of evolution. And of course the question is, because it is such a prevalent theory, are those evolutionists correct? Is man just an animal or an immortal soul in a mortal body as most religionists would argue? And the question of course is, can we know? Well, happily, the answer is yes, 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 we can know, for the Bible plainly reveals the answer of what is man. Now, the basic doctrine, you know, the basic doctrine of what is man is this, this one. Man is not an animal, and man is also not an immortal soul housed in a fleshly body. Man is rather, and woman, of course, com uh, humanity, then we can say, 
It's rather a totally mortal being with a spiritual component, which is only revealed in the Bible. It is the spirit of in man. You know, that component, the science has not discovered, that component no religion preaches, that component is totally, totally obscure and totally unknown to humans who, as you all know, believe in immortal souls. They believe that they go on after life, you know, after, after life and after death, they just go on living, some in hell, burning in horrible hell, because they married their, their lives merited, you know, this, 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 this eternal life in hell and eternal torment. And others just go on, you know, living as immortal souls, and their souls are just uh, traveling through the vast expanses of of, 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 of of cosmos, of universe, and seeking for, just to quote to you, the Orthodox religion, seeking the uh, blessed blessed place of refreshment. <laughs> Nobody, of course, knows what are those places of refreshment. But anyway, that's what the nominal Christians believe. The spirit in man, you see, on the other hand, gives the power of conscious human mind and free will, and coupled with God's Holy Spirit, it forms the converted Christian mind. And that's exactly what joins with the Spirit of God, is the spirit in man, and then these two, you know, they, they, they actually work in, a, work in unison, and that's how you have a converted human mind. Um, I'm not sure how many people really do understand that, but... Uh, Many people don't because, you know, the Protestantism has permeated this world to the point that all that the people just know is they have to accept Jesus in their heart and then everything will be great. Well, it's not in your heart, it's your mind. It's our mind that can receive the Spirit of God and then our mind can finally become converted, you see. And the Spirit of God then with the mind keeps working and, and, and keeps replacing the wrong thoughts, the wrong actions. Uh, the wrong thought processes, the wrong, the wrong words, and you know, over the time, we are becoming godlike. That is exactly what I've been emphasizing for 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 Sabbath after Sabbath. We have to become godlike. It's not about just about keeping the right day of rest. It is part of Christian experience. Yes, uh, keeping the right day of rest, keeping the holidays. Yes, certainly. Yes, most certainly. We're all required to do that. Uh, but I mean, you know, it can become rather than a ritual. It can just turn into an empty ritual. That we oh oh it's the day of rest. Now we should just we should just stop doing some things. We're not going to do things like other humans do, and we're not going to keep the wrong day of rest, uh, meaning the basically basically Sunday, the day of the pagan sun. Also because of, because we are not keeping the pagan days. Oh, we must be so right. We must be so righteous. We must be so set apart. We must be so superior to other human beings. No, we are not. We are not because we can keep the Sabbath as wrong as 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 we can do something wrong. Anyway, it can become just a shallow a shallow rite, a shallow ritual, and nothing more than that. So yes, it is the keeping of the Sabbath and keeping of the holidays, but with a proper knowledge and understanding, brethren, that's what is required. And proper knowledge and understanding requires that we that we have to endure, that we have to be patient, that we have to be so different from the world around us in order to be properly converted, if you wish, in order to be, that we build a, a holy, righteous, righteous and permanent character. And without that permanent character, we are not going to be entering into the kingdom of God. I keep saying that over and over and over again. I understand. I keep saying it because I'm not sure that people really get it. I'm not sure that people get it all at once. I'm not sure that people even think about it, you know, because they've been trained so for so such a long time. They've been trained in wrong religion, and you know, uh, and the matter of belonging is okay. You, you know, if you do something specific that no others do, then you belong to this this religion, and you're just not even the followers of Christ. You become just the mere listeners of Christ and, and and you're not disciples you just follow Christ but you are not really learning anything deeply you know being disciples of Christ means that we are studying his word meaning that we are understanding the point you know the point of keeping the law of God after all we don't keep it to be saved as the Protestants will often 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 pull pull that kind of uh, 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 accusation against us and that's, yes, you can understand the Protestants uh, doing that, not only the Protestants, but all the nominal Christianity. But what, what concerns me is that we always have a lack of, lack, of lack, of no lack of knowledge, lack of understanding to give them a proper response. And the proper response is no, we do not keep the law of God in order to be saved. We keep the law of God out of, 
out of gratitude because God loved us and gave us his law to guide us in our lives and to indeed helps us over time and experience build holy, righteous, perfect character without which we cannot inherit the kingdom of God. No, we are not keeping God's law to be to earn salvation. That's impossible. We know that we are saved by grace and we know that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and his life that allows us to now his life. His sacrifice was to pay for our penalty of our sins and his life is there to secure us that we can continue to live forever. So we are not, we are not, we are not inheriting the eternal life, you might say, because uh, because of uh, uh, because of his death, but because of his life. You see, and it's very clearly delineated in the book of Romans. You know, th those are things uh, that we need to understand, and those are things we need to give a proper response to when we are attacked baselessly. You know. Yes, of course, keeping God's law is a blessing. Of course, it just keeps us within the boundaries of 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 of, 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 of God's uh, how shall I say God's realm realm of the kingdom because it's the law of the kingdom of God. But we don't keep that law so that we will be saved, so that we will just earn salvation. No, not at all. We just keep it because it's our good and because God gave it to us out of His love for us, and we just return His love to, for Him to Him by keeping His law which does us good, helps us build perfect righteous character and uh, and makes us so different from the society around us because the world around us is so different from from whatever is written in the Bible and is claimed in the Bible as a true true way of life. And we have to be so different, brethren. And as I said a million times, I would much rather that people just know us as honest, uh, uncompromising people people who are truthful, people who will not lie, not steal, not want somebody else's, and so on. I would much rather people know us for that than know us, oh, they keep the Sabbath and holidays. Yes, fine, they could know us for keeping the Sabbath and holidays, but that's not the primary thing. But for many people in their mind, that becomes the primary thing in life, you know. And the Adventists have raised the Sabbath now to the, to the level of being a deity, basically. And all that you hear from them is the need to keep the Sabbath, the need to keep the Sabbath, the Sabbath, the Sabbath, the Sabbath, the Sabbath, fine. But is there anything else other than keeping the right day of rest? You know, when Jesus Christ says he was the Lord of the Sabbath, did he say, uh, keep my commandments before he before he was arrested and, 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 and soon after, after that killed? He said, keep my commandments in plural. And his commandments are nothing more or nothing else than the commandments of Jesus, of, of, of his father. Anyway, uh, it's, it's the Ten Commandments. Sabbath is only one of them. But, you know, somehow we, we, we tend, it's human nature, I guess, we tend to elevate just, just like we do with the sins, you know. They're horrible th sins, we think they're more horrible than the others. So we elevate some sins to the, to the level of, 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 of a horror and, 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 and a horror stories. And then they're, they're, they're this minor, like white lies, you know, what are minor sins, you know, it's not all that serious. Yes, it is all that serious. Because sin is a sin and it's equal in God's eyes. Whether it's an old, old sweet lady keeping Sunday or whether it's, uh, you know, any, any other kind of sin, regardless of the fact that she's a sweet old lady, she still keeps the wrong day. The day of the, the day of the pagans, the day when, when, when human sacrifices were being done yesterday, last night, I was totally shocked because I have a Serbian mythological language. Now, the, you may not understand why it was important because yesterday, 9th of January, is called Epiphany in the Orthodox uh, uh, tradition. And what is Epiphany? It's manifestation of God, you know. Supposedly, on that night, uh, the heavens get open and then, and, and then, and then the people are supposed to look through the window, out through the window, or look to the heavens, they're open, and then just make a wish. And then, oh, that wish, uh, the God will supposedly hear that wish and respond to it. Of course, it's all rooted in paganism, but the average Serbian person does not know that, brethren. But yesterday, last night, I just, uh, I just took this Serbian... Serbian dictionary. It was Friday night, so I thought, and I already was rested well, so <laughs> I just, I just thought, well, I'm just, I'm just still. Uh, why don't I just record this in Serbian language that they would understand? That one of the most important uh, holidays, celebrations in their tradition, is totally rooted in paganism. 
and they have the tradition today i'm not sure if it's if it is in catholicism but certainly not in protestantism in a freezing water because it's winter they just go and 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 and, and uh, swim they swim for the cross which is being placed in the river and then, of course, the, the the winner of the cross is something very, you know, very important, very sacred to Serbian people. But, you know, the cross actually was a substitute for the human sacrifice. Because usually, in the ancient times, as they swam for the cross, somebody would get drowned or would be drowned in the water. So that was a human sacrifice to the demon of water, you see, as our Serbian uh, experts have explained in this dictionary. But you see, the average Serbian piece of person wouldn't know that. It's a, it's a national event, you know. Every single uh, January 19th, it's a national event. You know, people are swimming for the cross, for the Holy Cross. They're swimming. That's that 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 that, that, that that's a national exercise. That's something sacred, something something elevated, something so important. But there is nothing godly about it, friends. And just like Serbian people are just so uh, ignorant about their religion, and just like uh, many other nominal Christians around the world are totally ignorant about their religion, we as God's people can be something totally ignorant about the purpose and about the true way of life that we are to live. And sadly, in the last how many? Well, it has been the other day. It has been I turned 53, and Mr. Armstrong. It was 38 years since his death. 38 years, 38 past years have done very well with the scattering, with the uh, fragmentation of the body of Christ. 38 past years have done perfectly. Satan has has had a heyday. He has done a perfectly great job to first of all divide God's people, and second of all to uh, make us all dummies, to make us all followers of our own ideas, to make us all followers become very, very, very. Uh, I'm looking for the lukewarm is the word. To become very lukewarm when it comes to the truth of God. You know, everything is relative, everything is acceptable, everything is fine. Uh, don't judge this, don't judge. Well, we have to make the proper judgment, I'm sorry. When something is not right, then the proper judgment needs to be made. Not that we condemn somebody, but we just, we just make a proper judgment that something is not right. Why is it written to Colossians that, you know, do not let anybody, any man judge you, but the but the body of Christ. You know, it's the body of Christ that determines how to keep. Well, the new moons are also mentioned, and fine, new moons and Sabbaths and holidays, and and, and, and that's it. How are you going to keep it and and, and and stuff? Yes, we don't have everything everything uh, delineated in the Bible. You know, this step and this step. No. But yes, based on the Spirit of God and based on 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 the on the Bible Bible uh, account, we can somehow decipher how to keep even the even the new moons. I discussed with my friend last night new moons. He said he went into studying the new moons and he was much into that in the past. And uh, he said, yeah, he said, Mr. Armstrong had to make a call, and he accepted the the car in the calendar that we we. we well, which is okay. Of course, you have to make a call because otherwise, if we all just make our own calls, then it's chaos, and everybody doing whatever is right in his or her eyes. So yes, we follow certain calendar because you know it says in Romans chapter two that the words of God have been committed to to the Jewish people, and it was very wise that we chose you know chose the calendar that is currently being used by the Jewish people. And to me, as far as I'm concerned, it is more important that we are willing to keep those holidays and we're happy about those holidays and that we be, that we be uh, uh, passionate about keeping those holidays, even if we missed the right day. But to God, the attitude is more important, you see. And to Him... The proper knowledge and understanding of why we keep the Sabbath and holidays and what is our purpose in life and what is the man, you know, to me that's more important than perhaps, I don't know, knowing something like, you know. But, you know, human nature is, is such, human nature just loves to, to argue about, about uh, very basic things. Human nature loves to make standards of righteousness. So in some countries, if, if females do not have the hand, uh, uh, the, the the head covering, you know, that's a big deal. That's almost a sin, you know. Even though the Bible is 
totally silent about it the bible says very well that you know long hair is 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 uh, is is really covering for a female long hair in a sense not to be you know not to be like like short male a uh, haircut and all of that stuff but brethren we have lost in the last 38 years we have been fragmented we have lost we have uh, there are various humans individuals who made sure that they're being followed and 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 and, uh, and respected you know hope of israel teaches you and everybody else that we need to re develop our personal relationship with jesus christ and this friend of mine told me last night very rightfully he said you know i've studied the calendar i i i i keep that knowledge i'm not going to cause any divisions i'm not going to keep you know various calendars i'll just you know the church had made the call made a call that's fine i'm obedient to that uh, and but nevertheless you know sometimes i think for what i know that perhaps the right way might be a day or two off or something. I said, it might be. And he says, you know, Christ is going to restore everything when he comes. Yes, he is. In the meantime, I said to him, all that I know about the new moon, and forgive me now for going on about the new moon, I'm just giving you an example. As far as I'm concerned, in the Numbers chapter 10, we have the description of how to keep the new moon. It's to announce the new moons by the, uh, by the sound of the trumpets, by the sound of shofar. And that's it. Nothing else is there given as to how to keep the new moon. Now, there are groups who keep the new moon, you know, be they Church of God, Seventh Day, or be they some other groups. And when they, when they approach me and ask, you know, is that a problem or we would, love to, we would like to work together with you? I say, no, it's not a problem. Because they're not keeping something sinful and they're not doing something opposite from God. We know from Isaiah that in the, in the world to come, in the kingdom of God, the new moons will be kept. And obviously, some parts of the true church in the past, based on what we read in Colossians, also kept the new moon. How did they keep it? I don't know. It's not. It doesn't say. How did they keep it? What, what, what involves keeping of the new moon? I don't know. But this friend of mine said, would you mind if we would just, for example, go out for dinner if there is a, uh, there is a calculation that we know that we see the crescent and all of that? I said, fine. Doesn't bother me. Is that something sinful? No. Is it commanded? No. Will we make it the commandment? No, we will not. But is there anything wrong with that kind of practice? No. Do I see anything wrong with people, some people call, keeping the new moon to the best of their understanding? No, no. I have no problem with that. They do it out of their faith. It's part of their faith. That's fine. One day, brethren, we are going to know perfectly well. We are going to know exactly the date and we're going to know perfectly well how the new moons are being kept and how are we to keep them because christ is got christ is going to rest restore all the things that's fine with me so you know conclusion was with, with with joy we're looking forward to the time when christ is going to restore the everything including the new moon in the meantime since we don't have enough instruction we 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 traditionally as a church you know ke did not keep the new moon because we just have we just have the commandment to uh, sound shofar. The trumpets are shofar, and thankfully there is enough uh, recording of shofar in in uh, on the YouTube channel. Then you can find you know you can find shofar along with 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 the uh, with the sound of, of falling water all along with the waterfall. You can find shofar you know lasting for about 15 minutes. And traditionally in Serbia we have done it sometimes you know. Uh, and I said to this friend of mine, just let me know before each new month starts, you know, starts, then we can, you know, you can even, you can even inform all of us here on this uh, basic big group. You can inform us. Oh, brethren, tonight starts the new, uh, new moon. And because it starts the new moon, we would say, fine. And since there is no instruction how to keep it, we can all just let shofar. We have all YouTube ch YouTube channel, you know, channel available. We can just let shofar sing in. He said, "Why didn't we practice this shofar? Shofar is mentioned in the Bible, brethren. It's there. Why did we ever do it? Because we thought it was the Old Testament or something Jewish. Well, whatever. Well, so what if it's something is Jewish? Is it biblical? It's biblical. Fine." The sound of shofar is an amazing thing. You all know if you ever listen to shofar, you just, you just, you know, your blood just gets frozen from, from the solemnity, from, uh, uh, 
Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It's a mixture of feelings. You feel it's like a fearful sound on one hand, you know. Uh, on the other hand, it's like a warning sound calling you to, to, to deeply ponder the, the way of God and to, uh, you know, how, how do you understand it? And then uh, calling you for repentance. Usually the shofar was there to alarm, to sign the alarm. The, the foreign armies are coming are coming at us and it was there you know at the beginning of the month obviously with a reason to uh, show us the need for repentance to instill in us this this feeling of of, of awe of the awesome God who has created this whole world you know and heaven and and, and, and earth and everything that is in it. It's, it's a beautiful sound. And no, we're not going to be fleeing away from it because I don't know, you know, it's a Jewish custom. So who cares if it's a, Jew, it's a Jewish custom? All the customs around the world that our, our members practice, if those customs are uh, within the boundaries of God's law, it's fine. And there are various customs you have, you know, when it comes to dancing, when it comes to singing, when it comes to this, that, and the other, when it comes to cooking, after all. <laughs> we, and my friend and I also talked about cooking. And we talked about something else, about the need for the day of preparation. He says, I never hear anywhere the, the, the need for preparation. So there are people who supposedly keep the Sabbath, but, you know, on the Sabbath, oh, they would just go for a shopping, you know, they, they need vegetables, they need this, that, and the other. Brethren, we have to restore all things properly. All right, there is a day of preparation, which is for shopping, which is for preparing for the Sabbath. And that includes food as well. No, no, cooking as in the strictest sense is not forbidden, but wasting your time on other things, including cooking, is equally wrong as, 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 uh, as I don't know, what else you would just find out to be as something wrong. So, you know, when it comes to cooking, we need to educate ourselves once again. We need to recapture the true values. We need to understand that there is a preparation day when we are to do certain things. Certain things, because that's why preparation day serves for. That's why God gave the preparation day. Paraskeva in, in Greek, or Friday, as we call it uh, in, in English. Uh, we call it after that, 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 that pagan, pagan deity of Frida. Anyway, but anyway, Friday, the sixth day of the week, is supposed to be the preparation day. And we're supposed to prepare for the Sabbath to the best of our ability. Yes, I know that certain foods like salads could be made to be fresh on the Sabbath. That's fine. God is fine with that. But some things, depending on where you live and depending on different cooking customs, may take much longer, you know. I mean, beans in much of the world do not come like half ready as, as in, in the Anglo-Saxon world. And those small in those small quantities of beans, there are not even that not a decent human being can be satisfied with that quantity. But you know that's how it is in the in the Anglo-Saxon world, and people just accept it. Particularly in England, they just accept it, and you know, and they go just they just go half hungry. To be honest with you, and I I, I always feel so sorry for English children. Sorry to say this, sorry if this is offensive to somebody, but I always feel very sorry for the English children because I always feel that they never have enough to eat. You know, when beans are cooked in other countries, like in mine, you buy, you go to the marketplace, you get a, a kilogram of beans or two kilogram of beans, or how, depending how many people are there in the household, and then you cook it. And it's in a huge pot. And then, you know, it's cooked to the... You know, to uh, the amount of that cooked beans is fine. That it could satisfy those who will be eating. It's not only beans; it's rice. It's with everything that, as far as I I know. But you see, that's the Serbian culture. That's the Serbian culture, and the Serbian culture has been always exposed to this collision of two worlds. On one hand, Ottoman Empire. So in Serbia, you'll find sweet stuff that you would not even find anywhere else in the world. Perhaps only in Turkey and Greece. But then you also find like spinach. A properly made spinach and the French every time I speak with French about certain things uh, when it comes to cooking you know every time I speak to them they understand what I said now friends spinach those of you in the Anglo-Saxon world who grew up without ever, ever eating proper spinach it's disgusting how the way how they make it there forgive me for saying again being possibly offensive 
But I mean, what child, I'm asking, you will find it so wonderful that you just... Uh, that you just put spinach in the water, you, you know, the, the water just boils, then you get it out, and you pour some vinegar and put some seasoning on it, and then eat it. I'm, I, you find me in this world a child who would enjoy that. But I can tell you the answer, I can tell you what my ancestors, how they made spinach. You will be shocked that milk could be used to make spinach. In fact, milk is used. But the French know that, you see. We obviously learned from French. You get spinach out of the water, then you cut it out a little bit, then you just start, then you start browning, browning the the, the, the garlic or the or the uh, or the onion, and then you pour spinach in there, and then you add milk bit by bit. You wouldn't believe how tasty, how beautiful it is, and I can tell you, every child or almost every child, almost every child in the world would eat it with 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 with, with passion. Just give you one one example. Now, of course, I understand uh, things like spinach may not be uh, may not be uh, useful to be made on the day of preparation. But yeah, you it can it can be made on the day of preparation, refrigerated until the next day. But even not, but still, the day of rep preparation, brethren, is still there for us to prepare for the Sabbath. And many people seem seem to have lost that kind of awareness and seem to have lost that kind of that kind of understanding. And here we are, hope of Israel, we have to restore that understanding. And yes, if it if it takes for some of you to learn some new cooking methods, yes, please be open minded. It's for the good of your and your children. Spinach, I always take spinach because I'm horrified how the spinach is being made and served to those poor children in the Anglo-Saxon world. It's horrible. It's disgusting. And after all, it's vinegar, if, you, if you're going to be honest. Is vinegar very healthy for your, for your, you know, for your, your overall well-being? Well, I tell you it's not, especially because it's alcoholic vinegar. Disgusting, yes. You know, there are things that we need to start practicing, brethren, not because, not because we're whimsy or because we have to be different from the world. It's for our own benefit that God has given it. And I, I've, I've just, uh, I've been talking now about the, the basic, my point was the basic, basic things in life. Basic things in life that we as the church have either neglected or we have forgotten about it or we just, uh, we are just so lukewarm today that we don't even know the day of preparation. It has to be, it has to be overcome, brethren. We cannot be so sloppy and slack in practicing the word of God. You know, all these big churches of God, God they just they just put emphasis on what? On the numbers. Oh, look how many we are. Who cares about the numbers? Who cares about the numbers? If the numbers were so, 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 so important, there would be no Gideon story about Gideon would not be there in the Bible. And those of you who missed my teaching on Gideon, on my YouTube channel, you have a Gideon. Go there and, 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 and search Gideon and you'll find... Something important about Gideon. Who cares about the numbers, brethren? It's the quality that matters. It's the quality of our personal relationship with God and Jesus Christ that will indeed see us through all these horrors that are yet to come. That are absolutely yet to come upon this world, especially upon the Anglo-Saxon world, brethren. Do not be deceived. Leviticus 26, Mr. Armstrong said in the book on, 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 on Britain and, and American prophecy, Leviticus 26 is a, a pivotal Old Testament prophecy. What does it mean, pivotal? Well, think about it. it. took me years to understand what it means. And after all these years, I've come to the conclusion that I was thinking, when, when at what point in our history is all this horror written in Leviticus 26 when in the world is it going to happen? Then I thought, well, of course, once the national currency crashes, I'm referring to dollar, by the way, once the national currency crashes, it's all going to come, come like, 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 like an avalanche. It's going to come upon the Anglo-Saxon world unaware of all this, unrepentant of all their mounting sins. It's going to come. But brethren, I'm not sure that many of you, some of you, many of you, how many, however many of you do, do understand that. Because you have never been through any, any, anything like that. 
And you see that the, 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 our, our problem is that because of lack of our experience and lack of our faith in the Word of God, we may not think that all those things will be that horrible, that awful as it is written. It will be. That's why, no wonder, that's one of the reason, another reason why Jesus Christ says you have to endure to the end. Because before the end comes, you're going to see people emaciated, you know, falling on the street from, from whatever disease. You'll be smelling out of the homes, you'll be smelling the, 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 the human flesh. Sorry to say that, but it's written in the, in the Bible. You're going to, to smell the human flesh being prepared for food. You're going to see who knows how many horrible things that you cannot even imagine. I, I keep telling my, my, my kinsmen, I said, you're going to see horrible things. Horrible things in America that you could never see. You're going to see mobs looting the supermarkets. Because what else would mobs do anyway? Once the distribution of goods is, 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 is messed up and people are hungry, what else do you expect mobs to do? <laughs> what do you expect the mobs? To sit down and, 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 and endure starvation? Of course not. Do you realize how the endurance is even, even, even uh, 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 undervalued today? People don't want to endure anything. The word sacrifice, sacrifice yourself for something. The word sacrifice is not even mentioned in our languages. As if that word has evaporated, you know. Even the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, when they speak about it, they speak with the word, with the word sacrifice, is kind of spoken, spoken kind of, yeah, with, with, with kind of, uh, well, if not disgust, at least with kind of, uh, you know, it's sacrifice because it's Christ. They would say the word sacrifice. But the way they say it, it's, they say it mostly like, it's like, oh, uh, yesterday was such a sunny and lovely day, you know. But the world has has lost totally its, its compass, spiritual compass. But we as Christians are losing spiritual compass along with the world, you know, because we don't stop to think uh, this horrible noise that you hear is one of my cats sneezing, by the way, and there's nothing I can do. You know, I'm, I'm doing my best to heat one room, but uh, they just got cold, all of them, and uh, it's, it's sad. There's nothing I can do. In any way, the point is, Along with the world, brethren, we are becoming dumbing, dumbing down. We're becoming, you know, uh, losing the the, the 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 standards, and we, as a hope of Israel, must not allow that to happen. We said, as we found it, we, when we got founded, we said we're going to set high standards of behavior and our mutual relationship to the point that that, that should be. So when people can see us from the outside, whoever those people would be, would be, they could say, "All right, these people are true Christians because look how they how they diligently follow the standards of God." And we have to, and we have to, in the process, we have to restore once again the knowledge of the preparation day, the knowledge of even the knowledge of cooking, the, the knowledge. You know, we have to be open for 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 for, for improvement of our lives. Even in those spheres like cooking and preparation day, so that we'll be building godly, righteous, holy, perfect character. Brethren, that's must. Because without that, no human being is going to inherit the kingdom of God. And it seems that many of us have forgotten about it. Because, you know, I hear reports from all sides of the world, and then, you know, there is report, you know, people going to buy vegetables on the Sabbath. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where is this awareness of the day of preparation? And stuff like that, brethren. We, we have to stop, you know, dumbing down our standards. And we have to stop dumbing down uh, the, 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 the principles. And we have to stop finding excuses in our lives. Oh, we... we uh, you know, I, I, I get sometimes, I get very puzzled because there are some things that, that people just make, make, make an issue. But now I understand what is the issue. The issue is eating on Friday nights. Oh, you know. Well, those of you who can eat on Friday nights, blessed be you because you have enough money for that. You know, most of us, at least I'm among those most of us have no money, barely have money to survive the whole week eating at home, not out on, on Friday night, you know. But if it happens, if it happens sometimes that, you know, the hectic week, somebody's ill, you don't find. 
eating out on Friday night is fine. And, you know, when I hear the news, oh, well, if you would ask people who serve there, they would probably have it closed. Well, if they want to have it closed, then let them close it, you know. But that's that's the wrong reasoning, brethren. Yeah, we don't want to eat on Friday nights because why should somebody serve us? Why should somebody, why should anybody make you food for us? That's okay. Now, if it happens, some extraordinary circumstance, that's fine. But to make it a habit, you know, well, let's eat every Friday, every Friday night. You know, to make it a habit, brethren, is totally, it's totally wrong. It's completely wrong. Making it a custom is makes it wrong. And we have to discern that. We have to be, become people of discernment. We have to become people who just discern things which is right and what is wrong. Because how in the world are we going to be ruling in the kingdom of God tomorrow if we don't discern right from wrong, brethren? If we are not being trained now in the good things, you see. And we have neglected all those things over the years because, you know, we had some more, perhaps, more priorities. The first priority, are we in the right place? of worship are we you know are we having are, are we being led by uh converted people yes i'm even saying that because now after all these 38 years after mr armstrong i'm coming to realize that no all those perhaps some great men that we we, we we consider to be greatly converted perhaps were not even converted you know and you may wonder what is the, the, the what is my starting point? Well, my starting point is somebody who was the world tomorrow uh, presenter. If somebody, after all these years, thirty eight years after Mr. Armstrong, can say and do away with the basic doctrines of Mr. Armstrong, like the seven church eras and the identity of of the house of Israel, if that's you know if that is the uh, problem, if somebody can do away with that. Well, then something is wrong with that person. Something is wrong with, with with conversion of that person. I'm sorry, but it's true. Because if there were two doctrines that Mr. Armstrong would, would, would emphasize over and over and over and over and over again, it was those two doctrines. And right now, for example, you see somebody from Asia has just left. Because to him, perhaps those doctrines are not important. You see, what does that tell you about the level of conversion of people in Asia or Africa or East Europe or you name it? We must not let we must not let all these 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 doctrines slip, brethren, and become and become just relative. You know, because in this world everything is relative. Everything goes. Everything everything is acceptable. Everything just. And then you have Pope, you know, blessing the the same sex, you know, uh, relationships and stuff, you know. So everything is relative. Everything is just, you know, everything is just, you know, oh, it 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 goes. Everything just goes. Everything is acceptable, you know. Don't judge anyone. Well, sorry, I'm not judging anyone. It's God who is judging and making moral judgment. He's not condemning, he's just judging and calling everyone for repentance. And we as people of God, we have to become always repentant, brethren. The, were you Before you were baptized, were you taught by your minister that all of your life will be now uh, repentance from what your past life? That all of your life you'll, you'll practice repentance? Did, you, did somebody tell you that? Well, if somebody didn't, then somebody missed, missed the important thing to tell you. So I'm going to tell you that. When you were baptized, like I was, weren't, were you not told that you are, no be, you are now being baptized? Well, no, they said I'm baptizing you. I'm baptizing you not into the sect and uh, uh, confession of this world, but into the very body of Christ. Were you told that, brethren? You have to be told that because that's the truth. That's the basic truth before you get baptized that you should know. That's why I, when I was working on the baptism formula, I just included all that was relevant that a baptism candidate should know. If we are baptized into the body of Christ, then we are in the body of Christ. If we are baptized into a church or a group or a sect or whatever, brethren, we miss the point, sadly. That's why we came up with this manual. This manual was for the uh, manual for services of God's people. Because we want old 
you know, all hope of Israel, worldwide church of God, ministers, leaders, whatever, to be on the same page and do the same thing. But at the same time, it's not only keeping the Sabbath and holidays, at the same time it is that we keep all that with proper understanding, brethren. If we don't keep it with proper understanding, what's the point? If you don't know that there is a spirit, the spirit in man, the only place where it is revealed, it is the it is the Holy Bible, it is the writing of the Apostle Paul. If we don't know that, then what's the purpose of us? What's the purpose? What's the purpose of us? We can keep the Sabbath all the all the long, like millions of people keep the Sabbath in this world. And what do they understand from keeping the Sabbath? They understand that they're so different from all these others for keeping the pagan holiday. Well, fine. They're so different, and what does what does what does that translate in their personal life? What does this being different in keeping the different day, the right day in our case, nevertheless, what does that make us different from the world if we are just like the rest of the world, behaving like the rest of the world, all the schemes and all these, all these, all these, all these, all these perversions of the world? What's the difference? And the usual teachings of this world are all totally anti-Bible. You know, the non-biblical misconceptions about the subject, uh, you know, about the subject of man, what is man. They go just from strong emotional attachments uh, of, uh, for scientists and religionists alike. They all have different concepts. And, and, and you know, many scientists, of course, believe in the unproven theory of evolution. And they think man to be merely the most advanced link in the unbroken chain of the animal life that spring that sprang spontaneously from chemical soup by blind chance. Horrible, isn't it? Religious people, on the other hand, they cling with equal vehemence to the belief that man is an immortal soul housed in an evil fleshly body, waiting to be freed at death and serve out eternity in blissful happiness in heaven or endless agony in hell. And if they're in heaven, they're all clapping their hands and waving, waving in the air, uh, praising their Lord day and night. Brethren, how, 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 how boring that is. Everything in this earth has to be restored. Yes, Jesus Christ says that the, 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 the time of refreshment, the time of restoration is coming. It's in Acts chapter 3 for those of you who, who missed it. It's there. We have to restore everything. All the extinct species, all the destroyed part of, of God's creation has to be restored. Whatever we read, more so, moreover, we read in the Bible that the whole creation is waiting for the appearance or the birth from above of the sons of God. Because all creation is just with, 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 with great suffering, just with great, uh, forgot, uh, it's not the utterances, there is another word, but anyway groaning that's right with great groaning the the, 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 the the creation is waiting for the birth of the children of God why it says so that the creation will finally depart from decay and death so you see brethren it depends on us it depends on us on our appearance as the born family of God born above born from above it depends on us do we understand that? I'm wondering, do we understand it? Do we get it, brethren? Mr. Armstrong used to cry, you know, to, to his audience, half of you don't get it. You should read, you should listen to his latest, his last uh, Pentecost sermon, 1985. When he was so provoked by all this ignorance, he was talking about too much Protestantism that has rubbed, up, uh, rubbed off on us. He talked about too much Protestant ideas that have become prevalent in our minds. He was telling people why they were called in the first place by God. And that they were not called primarily because of their salvation. It's given with a calling. He said that they were just called for something else. To become the, 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 the examples of in what, in what they do and how to live. Brethren, we have to become examples. We're now ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors for a foreign country. Kingdom of God is a foreign concept to the ma mankind, and we have to be ambassadors of that kingdom. Brendan, do you realize what responsibility that is? That is, uh, that is heavy, heavy laid on our shoulders. Do you understand how important it is? 
What's the purpose of preaching the gospel if, if, if we are going to be like the rest of the world? The gospel is not like the, being the rest of the world. The, 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 the gospel implies building up of character. That's also God's work. Not only how many countries are we going to reach and how many people are we going to reach with our preaching. Yes, it is part of it. But it's not the main part of it. The main part of it is with what, with what message, with what example are we going to reach those people, you see. Mr. Armstrong, in his frustration, would just scream, half of you and half of you here don't get it. He was wrong, brethren. More than half didn't get it. More than half didn't get it because several years after his death, about 10 years after his death, we have seen one of the big, massive changes, so-called changes were announced. We have seen what people have done with how much fervor they've just rushed to eat unclean stuff with how much fervor they just rushed to not to keep the sabbath anymore properly not to keep it even at all with what what fervor they rushed to keep again their things that god rescued them from you know christmases and easters and all of those all of those horrible things and then there are people who come here sorry again if this is a bit but i have to address these things and i don't know when and will i remember to address them all uh, uh, all these years but there'll be oh there was no use there was no uh, use of medical things and people dying and stuff who cares what is that your business people who didn't want to use medical assistance they did it out of their faith it was their faith in god who am i to judge their faith who are you to judge their faith and so they died. Yes, they died in faith, in faith in God, and they had unwavered faith in God that God was going to heal them, or if he doesn't want to heal them, then it's God's will to end their lives. And they just they, they, they died with that faith. What's wrong with that? Well, we can say, well, it's wrong because they could have. Yeah, fine, we can say that. But uh, what does God say? Don't you think that God is pleased that they just were just so, that they were so dedicated in their faith that they would not consult medical science but they would rather die i find that admirable because that shows you because the, the root of the medical science all of you know that is sorcery and witchcraft don't you know that and if you don't know uh well you better ask me and i can tell you some things that i know from in europe and I can tell you how all those who were involved in occult were just always people who were knowledgeable about the about the the, the um, medicinal herbs. In fact, in our ethnological studies on the Serbian religion, you you have a whole book on how the medical medicinal herbs were used for pagan purposes. So the root of medicinal, you know, science, and especially their drugs, so-called drugs, w w which supposedly heal us, they destroy our, for example, our 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 our, our stomach uh, stomach process and the uh, the um, what is the word the uh, digestion, yes, digestion process. But the root of all that, brethren, is sorcery and witchcraft. And some people didn't want to have anything to do with it. It's a marvel to me. Why should I now be, oh, poor them. What a horrible religion. Who says that? I don't say poor them. I say bless them. They died with a full, uncompromising faith in God. And I bet God is very pleased with that. But you see, our human, our stupid, limited human reasoning, oh, poor people, it is it? The same with treatment of animals. Yes, I've got several animals around me, and the youngest one is being very, very, very excited. So now you can hear some, some stuff and, and a noise because he is very playful, and now he is in the search, is in that search uh, 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 stage of his life. He he just wants to sniff everything, get everything. Oh, stupid animals! Who cares about the animals? We can. And you have people thinking, well, you cannot live like that. What do you mean, stupid animals? It's God's creation. Who gave you right to call God's creation stupid? You dummy. Those who think like that way. Who call you? No, but there are people who just don't think. That you, I've seen in Africa. I was disgusting to even eat with people who were just I, I who were just so heartless that I've seen. Who were so heartless and I couldn't eat with them when it comes to animals. And if I were some authority, 
I would have just, I, 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 I guess, just like Jesus Christ, what he did in the temple of God, I would have probably, probably run there and, and I would have made a whole mess. Let the thing be worse, those were the people who, who were basically rescued from starvation from a church organization they belonged to. Or that they supposedly belong to, because you never know with some people whether they're really, their heart is really there and not. And that's what I've, I've said enough. We have seen enough of that already. And we have had the very, very, very pinnacle of that happening to us. When treacherous, horrible, disgusting, carnal people lied about us. And that lie has been now recorded and now is spread around. Because we just, oh fine, we just allow them. Why, sh why did we do that? Shame on us. Why did we do that? Somebody's heart was not with us? Fine. Somebody's heart was not in the kingdom of God? Fine. Get out. And no longer am I going to, am I going as a presiding elder, I'm not going to tolerate anymore. Oh, just let's leave them. Let's just uh, do some trap. Let's do this, that, and the other. Because look what they've done. Look what they have done to us. With their lying lips. Yes, they will pay to God for that. But in the meantime, we have to be paying for that. Why did we tolerate them? Why did we allow them even to stay in our midst for a while? We don't own. We don't need such people. Those people who are dishonest, out. And as soon as we find it, out. Because those people are not fit for the kingdom of God. And they're certainly not fit to be part of the hope of Israel. Enough. And I'm going to have no compromise with that. And to be very honest with all of you, I'm not going to waste my time anymore with, 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 with certain parts of the world that prove to us to be crooked and carnal and warped up. And as soon as we catch those individuals trying to do some something like we did, the, 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 the fellow from India is no, not here. If you notice, some of you, why is he not here? Because he was kicked out. Because behind my back, he was trying to secure financial help for his travel to Nepal, to that stupid, stupid anointed conference. Oh, my. Well, look, look, fellow, if you do not understand the plan of salvation, I'm not going to help you in your, in, 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 in your deception. And certainly I'm not going to give any any dime. I'm not going to give one dime for some kind of anointed conference on which poster you see a bunch of people with the t-shirts with a cross sign and 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 in a bunch of people with a cross sign and 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 and, and that's supposedly a, 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 a anointed conference. I told him already, I said, if you're going there, you should go and tell those people what's wrong. That cross is not the Christian symbol. You should tell them all the right things, and that's fine. And if God is calling somebody, fine, that somebody will come. If God is not calling anybody, then nobody will come, and that's fine. There is nothing we can do. It's God's prerogative. Brethren, we have to stop pretending to be God. And we have done it so much damage with, 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 with you know, uh, uh, neglecting on one hand, the principles of right living, godly living, like day of preparation, for example. And on the other hand, pretending to be God, you know, being judgmental and judging everything and everybody and every. Please just stop it. Stop it. Judge your own life. Ask yourself, where have I failed to behave in a repentant way? The people who have just lied about us this past week and they've just uh, they've just uh, said lies were the people who were with us until yesterday. But the worst of all, sorry to say that, the worst of all, I find out that those people, some of them, were known to us as not being honest. But we just kind of let them because we thought it will be it will be to our advantage. We will see what advantage we have now. I don't want to tolerate anyone anymore. One day more, one hour more to tolerate anyone in hope of Israel who is dishonest, who is disgusting, whose heart is not in the work of God, but in personal interest. 
We all have personal interests, that's fine, but those personal interests have to be equal to the interest for the work of God. Otherwise, what are we? We made a grave mistake, and I'm waiting for the right moment to discuss that with, uh, with a person who was in charge of that. I know he did everything out of, the, out of his best interest for the church and for the work, but we see now it's wrong, friends, it's wrong. And from this time on, I don't want to tolerate one more day or one more hour anybody who is dishonest to tolerate him or her in hope of Israel. Enough. There are plenty of carnality out there. There are plenty of carnal churches of God. There are plenty of those who care about the numbers and about the sizes. Let them go there. We don't care about the numbers. Mr. Armstrong taught us that. Brethren, the moment you start caring about numbers, the moment you are just you're just off the track. The numbers are to God to decide. Yes, indeed. And the church is to do something else, is to restore, be restoring the strong, the strong principles of right living. And I want us now from now on. You see, that's why I'm, I'm, I, I, I broke from reading the prophets, because I want us to recapture once again the true understanding. And yes, our topic today is what is a man? So surprisingly, both of these theories by scientists and, and religious, pe religious people, both of those theories, brethren, are wrong. And of course, the theory of evolution does not make the pretense of originating with the Bible anyway. But these religionists, these, 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 these fanatics, these religious fanatics with their, 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 you know, in most of your world you live, it's except Jesus in your heart. In, 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 other, in other parts of the world, it's like, oh, fanatically holding on to certain customs that they think is, must be Christian. Otherwise, otherwise God is going to punish you. You know, they, they created God. It's amazing what this horrible Christianity created God to be, to be a punisher, to be uh, evil, to be lawless, to be uh, cruel, to be, to be uh, psychologically disturbed because he gave one set of the laws in the Old Testament and all of a sudden there comes a, another. He's, now those laws are bad. So in the, in the New Testament, he just releases the world from the law. Brethren, how stupid that is. They've made God, they've made God a stupid, idiotic, schizophrenic. That's what they've made God to be when you think about it. Do you have enough discernment, brethren, to turn on your brain Use the brain, the mind God has given you, and to come to that conclusion, as horrible as it may sound. But that's the, the, that's the, 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 the gist of the matter. However it sounds. We cannot allow that kind of, that kind of world and the world reasoning to, 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 to affect us. We cannot, brethren, because that's, that's that, 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 what are we? If we make God schizophrenic and stupid person schizophrenic God, then who are we serving? What are we as servants of what? A schizophrenic God? It's time for us to, 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 to start using. I, I, I constantly keep calling you upon use, lose what you know, brethren. Use what you know. Discern, 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 discern. I keep saying that because that is what the people of God have never been trained to do. They've always been trained to pay, pray, and obey. Well, sorry about that. Sorry about that because I'm not the wisest person. That's why we have the advisory council after all. And to pay, we all owe everything to God. To pray, certainly. We, 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 we are praying to God, certainly. You're not praying to a human, I hope. But the whole of Christian experience in the past was pay, pray, and obey. No, my approach is pay, pray, and obey. Certainly you should have done that, but not neglect other things like use your brain and use your discernment and come to the proper conclusions, you know. Just like I'm doing this with this, my friend, friend who is who is now, I haven't been in touch with him for a while. You know, we, 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 we just start talking like friends and we just reason and we bring various arguments, you know, to the table. And at the end, we come to the right conclusion. You see, 
And not nobody, none of us, the two of us, because we are dedicated to one God and we serve one and the same Savior and one and the same God, we, 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 we don't get into any collision uh, about arguments uh, or, or disagreement. No. He tells me what he discovered by, for example, studying the calendar or studying these uh, intercalations or, 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 or the, 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 that terminology and the, uh, the crescent moon and all of that. I tell him from um, my perspective what I've concluded with, you know, studying the same or hearing about the same. I, 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 I just there, and then we come, we, we come to the middle ground that we agree. And the middle ground is look, we're not going to deny the knowledge. The knowledge is important, certainly. God is not against the knowledge. And our knowledge is that we know that the new moons will be kept in the world tomorrow. Yes, that's what it says in the Bible. And we know that all the things will be restored. That's what it says in the Bible. So we are agreed. One day the whole world will keep the new moon, but this time Jesus Christ is going to restore it, and we will know how we will keep it, and we will know what. In the meantime, yeah, we can just sound so far. And then the, 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 the side question comes, oh, well, wait, wait a second. We'll sound so far. Why hasn't the church used so far sound all these years? Brethren, I don't know why, and I don't care why, but I can tell you I will be using shofar sound to the end of this age. Because when it says the trumpets in the Bible, it's shofar, brethren, it's shofar. The shofar that the Jewish people use it to this day. So why? Should we not use shofar because the Jewish people use it? Of course, that's stupid, dumb, dumb, dumb reasoning. Of course we'll use it. If any nation does anything that is biblically and right, are we going to follow that example? Yes, of course. Why not? But I'm telling you all of this because, you know, we, we bring to the table, we, we put those two arguments, we try to discuss about those things, we exchange the ideas, and at the end of the story we come to the same conclusion. We have the same conclusion, as far as I'm concerned, totally balanced conclusion. And we think, okay, we have done something good now because it will be beneficial for our spiritual lives. Right? Right. Anything wrong with that? No. No. But I would love you, when you think for yourselves, to stop and start to think, well, should I go for the vegetables? Yes. If you have forgotten to buy milk for baby or whatever, and it's the Sabbath, and you have forgotten it because of whatever, would you let your baby starve or will you go go and buy milk? Of course you'll go and buy milk. I mean, don't get me wrong again. I'm speaking generally now. Reason with yourself. Wait a second. Shall I just... Shall I just let the whole week get, go by and then I, on the Sabbath I should go and get some vegetables? What kind of reasoning is that, brethren? It's a good reasoning. Fine. Should I do that? Well, if I happen to have such a hectic week and I just slipped out of my mind, okay. But if you are waiting on purpose... Oh, the Sabbath, I'll be free and stuff. And on purpose, and then instead of using the preparation day, then you go buy vegetables, brethren, you have certainly violated the principles of God. And if that becomes your habit, that means you just get into the rut of the habit. And what kind of character is that? <laughs> Did Jesus Christ wait all week along for, for, for all week along to go by and then just... Oh, and somebody would say, oh, but his disciples went. His disciples went as they were walking by a chance during that, you know, next to that field. And they just went probably out of curiosity because the field was, 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 was sprouting already. So they went into the field out of curiosity and they just, you know, while they're still there, okay, let's just pluck a little bit. And yeah, we are hungry and this seems to be ripe. So let's just pluck and eat some of it. Fine. That's the whole thing. It wasn't that they were just waiting for a purpose for the whole week to go by and they say, all oh, right, now with purpose, I'm going now to... Of course not, brethren. Just like when I was in Ukraine <coughs> in 94, it was a Sabbath morning and we were going to the local library of a small town, Hoost, to keep the, keep the, 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 the Sabbath. And there was an old lady who just uh, were, was passing by. The first time I've seen the old lady. 
oh son could you just help me and 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 and, and, and uh, help me uh take this sack of whatever was in the sack and just just put it on my back because i'm not able to lift it myself i did it of course didn't have the second thought about it but my friend Mikhail next to me said to me oh you know many people here in this country would not do that because they'll do it on the sabbath well fine brethren what does the sabbath mean to that old lady perhaps she was taking something that was her life might have depended on but she was taking perhaps woods or coal to be to be heated at home for example even though it was it was the, the 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 summer but anyway she might have been taking something to feed her chickens and 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 and, and other livestock so first of all even on the sabbath doing that is not forbidden number one number two why should i judge she doesn't know what the sabbath is and number three i see the lady for the first time and i didn't do it out of evil intention if i did if i said fine Oh, this is going to bring me again. Fine, yeah, old lady. Give me $100, $50, $20, and I'll do it. That would have been wrong, brethren. That would have been terribly wrong. But I just did it out of humanitarian concern. That's all. Now, I'm asking you, have I committed horrible sin back in 1994 for doing so? I don't think so. But the discernment is what is lacking in the church of God all the time, brethren. People just like discernment. They, then, then, then they come up with, 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 with a problem like, should we be eating on Friday nights? And if you want, my response is no, you should not. But if there is, if it happens, I don't know what might happen. You never know what life brings. There is a horrible hurricane, David. Oh, I just find it so 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 amusing how you people in the Western world find funny names for those horrible things. So it's it's a lovely Catherine, or it's a lovely a lovely uh, Sue, uh, you know, or whatever name you name for those those hurricanes, which are horrible, horrendous things. When they do, but they have a lovely name. So if that's not relativization and and dumbing down the truth, I don't know what is. So let's say if the, the hurricane, hurricane, hurricane Caroline comes, and then perhaps all of a sudden, right after Caroline comes, Hurricane David, and I don't know, life just gets so messed up because sometimes it there are things that happen like that, brethren. And Jesus Christ for foresaw that. That's why he said, if the if an oxen falls in the ditch on the Sabbath, will you just leave it there to suffer the whole Sabbath? Of course not. So if there are some extraordinary circumstances that just, you know, mess up the, the, the normal life, and okay, oh, we didn't, you know, the hurricane Catherine destroyed all of your food supplies, and yeah, should we go out for it on Friday nights, or shall we just, you know, shall we just stay on Friday and just live miserable, miserably live, and of course that you'll go out and eat on Friday nights. Brethren, and when we are at the Sabbath, and this will be the last thing, and I'll continue now with, with, with humans and men, and what, what is man? Brethren, what happens, do you realize, do you understand, and if you don't, please listen to me carefully now. We overall keep the Sabbath in spirit, and not even by the letter. Oh, oh, how can you say that? Well, I can say that because it's true. If we kept the Sabbath by the letter, there would be no usage of electricity because the electrical company is making money and profit. You would be not using running water because, or you would just prepare, you know, spare running water before the Sabbath because, oh, now on the Sabbath, the, uh, the water company is using. You see, brethren, you can, and you can argue with that all, all along. Oh, should somebody travel? travel on the sabbath here well yes if it's keeping the the, the whole keeping the, the holy time and and if it is learning yes of course you should travel because that person is not traveling to make some money and make some the, the what is forbidden as you know in the sabbath command what is forbidden is using things that contribute to your uh, to a li livelihood or whatever you call it to a living uh, whatever you call it in english anyway and if you're traveling, not because of making money, but perhaps to visit the sick or to, to attend the services, that's fine. 
But if you, you know, if you're traveling to make some business and stuff, then that is not fine. But can we finally use our spirit in men? Can we finally use any woman, spirit in women and spirit in men? Can we finally use that spirit coupled with the spirit of God? Can we finally use it to discern things? Discernment, brethren, is one of the things that was, has always been lacking in the church of God. And then we're just like small children. You know, do, do you think that Paul wrote in vain that we should be not like small children being tossed and turned by every wind of the doctrine that comes? And today we're exposed to winds of the doctrines of, from all sides, from governments to religious leaders. And all that you have to do is just use discernment, brethren, for what you know from the Bible. What do you know about the Sabbath command? Hopefully you understand what is forbidden on the Sabbath command. And then nobody would ask a question if a widow from one side of the town should travel to the other side of the town to keep the Sabbath and have a holy convocation. That, that, that's ludicrous even question. But, you know, people just make those questions, friends, and they just make the whole big issue about it and then these arguments. And then we're just like small children being tossed and turned by every wind of doctrine that comes our way, unable to explain to us, number one, to us, let alone to others, what's wrong with, 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 with or what is not wrong with certain things. So many people, I, I, I mentioned medical practice, perhaps in half an hour ago. But in so many people went along with this vaccination during COVID-19. They went along with the vaccination without even critically thinking about it. Well, do you really think that pharmacomafia, do you really think that the government is really so willing to see you to be to be well, well off and to be healthy and robust in health so that you will be... Do you think really that that's what they want? They have your best interest at heart. Do you really think so? If you think so, then you're terribly wrong. Because the Bible says this is a present evil world. I'm quoting the Apostle Paul. If this is a present evil world that involves everything, everything and everyone in government and, and medical uh, science and any science in, in general and so on. And you cannot convince me that this is not a terrible world because friends, I've never had worse winter in my life. I cannot heat enough, obviously, one room enough. All of my cats are just, just, just so you can see them, sneezing, coughing. One of my cats was coughing the other the other week, was coughing like a human. <laughs> and you just think, oh my. One of other my cats, he's just barely moving. He's a big cat, but yeah, the, the winter came along and he's obviously, he's affecting something, he's affecting his health, I don't know what it is. I'm supposed to take them for vaccination, annual vaccination. The, the, the animals have annual vaccination, and that's a different stuff than the humans. I have no money for that, brother. And I've been I've been running into financial tr troubles all this time. I'm supposed to travel in two days. I'm supposed to travel to the north of the country for a commemoration of the genocide committed in that part of the country 82 years ago. Then I'm supposed to stop in the capital of Serbia and have this international conference to participate in that. And the organizer is so excited. They're all so excited, but that's fine. But I'm wondering, how will I end with this month? How will I end with this month? How, how, what, what is going to happen with these animals? How will I survive without a washing machine? Oh, washing machine. Yes, it's 21st century. And this is not Asia or Africa. This is Europe. You know, all kinds of things. And you now are going to come to me and convince me, look at a wonderful, lovely, positive, positive, wonderful world in which we live. Look at all these wonderful, wonderful uh, things. Look at all these wonderful inventions. And, you know, how can you say it's an evil, evil world? Well, morally, it's evil. That's what Paul says. Just like I had people in the past. Oh, how come you are living such a difficulty? When, well, I said, because I don't live with, with mom and dad like most of you in your 40s. Oh, how come you don't have children? I said, because I don't have mom's or grandmother's pension to support me, you know. The state has to pay the pension, but the state is not obligated to, <laughs> to employ anybody else. 
Now, friends, you don't even know, many of you, how, how difficult it is to live in different parts of the world. Many of you think that the world is like America. Everything is like in America. No, it's not. Everything is drastically different than in America. And that was makes and even in America you have <coughs> people losing their excitement for religion. And excitement for the true knowledge, brethren. Why is this horrible things happening? I, I, I said I said it was the last digression, but fine it doesn't matter. I think what I'm telling you is all relevant. So listen to me, better listen to me. Why is this horrible punishment coming from America? Do you think Americans are the worst people in the world? Yes, many people think so, even today. today, Based on their experience with American government, which, to be honest with you, to other people, is very horrendous. Meddling into the affairs of other countries and, and, and doing all kinds of horrible things. Most of you Americans don't know that your ambassadors are obligated to push LGBT agenda in every country where they go. Most of you don't know that because they never tell, tell you that. You, most of you don't even know how many enemies you have made already in the Arab world, in the Slavic world, in all the worlds because people are just horrified by that. But what can you do? So your tax money, your tax dollars go to be financing LGBTQ and whatever else is the agenda. And most of you think, oh, it's a lovely, lovely, the lovely world. It isn't that just, just beautiful. It's just like, I mean, no, it's not like America. Ask somebody who lives in China what kind of world is there. How about the dog festival in China? Ever heard of that? When they're skinning dogs, alive dogs, in cauldrons with hot water. Yes, that's what they're doing 21st century in China. Horrible. Be horrified now. That's your lovely world. When I listen to people, lovely world. Beautiful world. Yeah, sure. Here you have your wonderful, beautiful world. I don't want it. I want the kingdom of God to come here and, 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 and bring dictatorship. And those of you who have been fed with this uh, democracy, human rights, and all, all the rest rubbish, forget about it. The kingdom of God is not going to be about hum human rights and freedoms and democracy. No. Because human democracy has shown us what it has brought to this world. It's destruction and death. It's going to be a dictatorship. Yes, yeah, sure. Oh, you sound like Russians. No, I sound like Bible. Because if you didn't read Zechariah 14, you better go and read it. How is God, how is Jesus Christ going to come? And how is he going to install and usher in that wonderful world tomorrow? By crushing all the opposition first. Destroying it. That is this wonderful world. This is this rubbish that they feed us since we're little, oh, wonderful, beautiful world. And, you know, when, when I lived in under the communist regime, it was, yes, we are the greatest, uh, the highest stage of human development. Oh, really? And all these other previous civilizations, they're just primitive civilizations. Primitive civilizations. You're going to tell me that Egyptian civilization was primitive. You're going to tell me that, you name it, was primitive. Really? Oh, Really? But brethren, that's what they taught us when we were little. It took me years to discern those things. Discern, you know, that's the word I'm driving at, discernment. Discern those things and realize, wait a second, this was a horrible deception. Who has a right to call other civilizations backward and, 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 and primitive and underdeveloped who the communists godless communists who thought they were the highest the highest pinnacle of human development oh really well they're so highest that all communists all the communist movement all over the world has basically crumbled in any way the proponents of the Immortal soul theory, on the other hand, uh, unlike the scientists, they assume their belief has its roots in God's word, the Bible. But of course, they are equally incorrect like these scientists. 
For brethren astounded with the belief in the immortal soul arose not from sound biblical doctrine taught or written by the prophets or apostles, but from ancient, ancient heathen <laughs> Egypt indeed. Egypt, when you study the civilization of Egypt, you will realize that there was not that was not a primitive decadent civilization. Oh no. They knew how to preserve dead bodies. Did you know that they knew they had a makeup even back then? Did you know that the Egyptians had the uh, the uh, the fillings for your teeth and all kinds of things? And you tell me that's a primitive civilization? Oh, really? And then, of course, in association with demonic power, they had all kinds of miracles back in those days. You know the Stonehenge, which is now oh. Stonehenge and various other things we may not even understand to the to the, to, the, to, the, to the true extent, but those things are just the 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 the, the uh, extension of civilization back then. It's just like civilization today is doing some genetic manipulations, and who knows what they do behind our backs, brethren. And you know the, the worst, the the, the 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 pinnacle of all naivety of us Christians is what I hear. But it's privacy. I had to shout so many p times at people in America and at believers in America, so supposed believers, brethren. Privacy is a god you have created. The privacy does not exist. The moment you become a Christian, your privacy is out of the window. That moment you're immediately enemy to your society, enemy to your science, enemy to your people, enemy, you name it for what? Especially because they're wacky, crazy people who do believe, sadly, similar that we believe in the literal fulfillment of Revelation. And those people, even sadly, David Koresh, one of them, kept sadly the Sabbath and the holidays, but most of you don't seem to know that. So we, our privacy is gone. Because we were a potential threat to our societies. They're listening to us. They're following us everywhere. They're listening perhaps even to these Skype services. Is that going to stop us from serving God? No, it won't. But I'm just telling you, the privacy does not exist in the life of a Christian. Your phones are tapped. You're being followed everywhere. Yes, even in your freest countries in the world, like England and like America. Yes, you're being followed, I tell you. And one day when we discover that as the government of God, you'll be probably terribly shocked. The other day there was Snowden, uh, Snowden movie showed on our national TV. I think it's it's directed by Oliver Stone. I might be wrong, but Oliver Stone is well, he, he is one of those one of those uh, individuals with very respectable, very respectable for his stance. He is he is willing to even, you know, tarnish the the, 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 the reputation of his own government for the sake of the truth, and I appreciate that. Stone was shown the other day. The movie of Oliver Stone was shown on TV. And remember, if you know anything about Oliver Stone, at one point in that movie, he says, how did they surveil all of these? Old oh, don't worry. They surveil all of mobile phones in the world. Oh, yeah, really? Well, guess whose mobile phones are more, uh, 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 more surveilled than others? Of course. And you think, but we are nice, sweet, decent, law-abiding citizens. Why would anybody follow us? Oh, brethren, stop being so naive. In the eyes of this world, we are a threat. We propose, we preach the other kingdom, the other king. We preach the, the, the doing away with all these governments. Oh, come on. Don't be, don't be that naive. What can a, a carnal human mind think when... It hears these kinds of doctrines. So anyway, what was adopted this 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 this, this uh, immortal immortal soul? Well, it was adopted by pagan Greek philosophers like Plato. Then later on, it was it was uh, uh, you know passed on to the to the uh, uh, Roman philosophers, and finally. This whole idea, totally wrong idea, the first lie that you read about in the, in the Garden of Eden, infiltrated traditional Christianity through church fathers who themselves believed the teaching 
but who had adopted it from pagan Greek philosophy and not from the Bible, you see. That's the whole thing. So no wonder the Apostle Paul wrote to us, Colossians 2, 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man. But brethren, we need not rest on the historical record alone, for the doctrine of the immortality of the soul falls shattered to the ground in light of the plain teachings of God's word. And like I said many times, every time you are in doubt, every time you hear some kind of doctrine and you are in doubt, the first thing that you should remember is, what does the word of God say? And most of you, I believe, if not all of you, do know what does the Word of God say. So all that you need to do is just, okay, what does the Word of God say? Okay, the Word of God says, you will remember, the Garden of Eden. The Word of God says, God told them, you know, you shall not eat of this tree, because the moment you eat of it, you shall surely die. Is that what the Word of God says? Yes, that's what the Word of God says. Is God a liar? No, it's, it's certainly not part, has never been part of his character to lie. So if you'll surely die, then obviously if the soul, created soul, if the man who became the uh, living living being or living creature, the created soul became the living soul, the man can die. Because that's what said, uh, that's what our creator said. Fine. Away goes the immortal doctrine. <laughs> you know, just by logical thinking and using your common sense. But you know, we have never been throughout our, our Christian life, I've never heard the church encouraging people, humans, you know, there was always this pray, pay, and obey what others tell you. Well, fine, but you have your own way. You don't have to be depending on others. What if I'm dead? What if you cannot connect with me or with somebody else? And you're faced with the doubts. Okay, is man uh, cre created, is, is man an immortal soul? All right, wait a second. What does the Word of God say to us? And after all, do we find the word immortal soul anywhere in the Bible? No, we don't. That's another good argument. In fact, it says twice in, in Ezekiel chapter 18 that the soul that sins, the same shall die. Do souls sin? Well, he, uh, the book of Romans 6.23 tells us everyone has sinned and lost the glory of God. Fine. If everyone, then it's everyone. Then the point is that the question of whether it's whether is there an immortal soul, and uh, could immortal soul be so immortal they can never die? Mm -hmm. Obviously, the answer to all of that, to all of that, the answer is no. End of the story. So to be sure, the Bible does indeed use the word soul, never the phrase immortal soul. However. The word soul is merely a translation in the Old Testament and the New Testament of other words from both Hebrew and Greek. So we must look to these languages, sadly, sometimes we do, even though, even though uh, you know, it's, it, it's a hustle and it's a struggle to understand foreign languages, but we have no choice. We must look to these languages and the context in which the words are used if we are to understand the word translated soul in all of our Bibles. So to begin, we notice the man, that man became a living soul according to Genesis 2.7, and we observe that this verse does not say man has a soul. He doesn't have a soul, he is a soul. All right, so that already makes a huge, humongous Humongous, huge difference. So, uh, not only does the word translated soul in the Old Testament not imply immortality, nor even superiority to animals, because they're all described as living souls, as nephishes, but it's even used to represent dead bodies in Leviticus 21.1 and Leviticus 21.11, in Numbers 6.6, 6, in Numbers 6.11, and elsewhere. Aha. Uh -huh. And twice, in the same Bible, chapter in Ezekiel 18, verse 4 and verse 20, does God directly say when speaking of human beings, the soul who sins shall die? The Greek word translated soul in the New Testament, you find in the 1 Corinthians 15, famous chapter on resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, verse uh, 45. The word soul is used in a similar sense, referring only to physical mortal life. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus himself proclaimed that the soul can be destroyed in hell, as he said, as it's translated in hell, but it's not, it's not the word hell, of course, it's the word grave in, 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 in Greek. But the hell, as we commonly picture hell, is actually what, we, what is called in the Bible the, uh, the lake of fire. 
The Apostle John in 1 John chapter 3 verse 15 shows men are not immortal souls with his statements that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So if a human does not have eternal life, then he cannot be a mortal soul, as logical as it could be. As logical as it can be. You know, very often I, because I have cats and love cats, I remember the, uh, the Tweety, little Tweety from cartoon, and he says, I saw, I saw a pussy cat. As plain as he can be, he says. <laughs> That's a very funny phrase in English language, but yes. You know, I, I saw the Bible and read the Bible as plain as it can be, you know. We read the Bible as plain as it can be. Yes, it's not always very easy to understand it. Sometimes it just demands that we consult foreign languages and stuff, but it's okay. The doctrine of the Bible is as plain as it can be, but humans have messed it up, of course. Who else? Everything that human hand has touched has, has messed up everywhere in the world. And to those of you who grew up believing that your state departments and your governments are so pristine and sinless and stuff, you better get out of that belief because it's not true, brethren. All the rest of the world will testify to you that it's not true. Many moves and decisions on your government or part is basically for their own purposes, their own beings, their own pockets, their own money. Stop believing these balloonies and lies. And stop believing that you are, you know, so free. Nobody controls you because you're joyful in your privacy. When I hear the word privacy, my alarm just goes off. But then we cannot be so dumb to think that way. Much of our legis legislation comes from Rome and Roman law. They have a they have a subject in 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 in, in the uh, in, in in Serbian university, Roman law. And students have to study and to pass the test in Roman law. So much Roman is there in our civilization. Roman falsified history. I told you the other day about the Parthian Empire. Brethren, it's all part of the falsification. Nobody ever heard of the Parthian Empire because the Rome has made sure we don't hear about it. Rome and Roman. And one of the Roman is your privacy and human rights. No, brethren, once we become Christians, we're not, we have no human rights. They count us as sheep for slaughter, says King David in Psalms. We're killed for your sake every day, King David says. <coughs> Does that sound like freedom and human rights? No, it doesn't. And we better understand that, brethren, before it's too late, before, before we're getting hit with all kinds of injustices. And you'll be wondering, where does this come from and all of this stuff? Well, it comes from Satan, the devil, and this is his world. This is not God's world. Can we understand that? Yeah, we kind of understand it academically, but we don't really grasp it fully with our hearts because, you know. <sighs> Paul proclaimed man's mortality with the words, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23, it's not immortal life in hell or immortal life in heaven. So clearly the doctrine of, of the immortal soul is a myth foisted upon Christian world from paganism. Friends, and that's the, that's the, uh, I keep underlying that because I wonder, do you understand why was this, why did Satan use that first lie to human beings in the Garden of Eden? Because that, the whole doctrine of immortal soul stems from him and he just wanted and he succeeded to uh, convince humans that that's what they are. But that's not what man is. You see, the, the subject is what is man? No, man is not immortal soul. And so more must be said perhaps about the immortal, this important topic of what man is. For although man is merely a mortal soul, a mortal living, breathing creature like an animal, man is nonetheless clearly not a mere beast like a monkey or a goat or a horse or or an elephant or whatever other creature you may choose. For men, unlike the animals who have been made each after their own kind, remember Genesis 1.25, and God created such and such after their kind, and he created such and such after their kind, and all of the world, created world, is after their kind, but, but let us make men in our own image, God family says, and man, unlike these animals, is made in God's own image and likeness, it says in Genesis 1.26. Therefore, 
Man is created after the God kind and with God's general appearance. Oh, oh. Oh, now we're into something. Well, what is man? But how many of you in Africa and Asia do understand that? How many of you in America and Europe do understand that? And that's the plain teachings of the Bible. You see, you see, brethren, why we have to go through those basic, most basic doctrines of the Bible. Because it is amazing how much we have lack of discernment. How much we just, all that we do is we just go through emotions like in this life. You know, without thinking what we believe, why we believe it, and what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say that we should believe and that we should conclude about such important doctrine as what man is? So, even more importantly now, speaking of what man is, is the fact that man has a spiritual component, the spirit in man, which when combined with a human brain produces the human mind, which is unique, self-awareness and capacity for free will character development. And as the book of Job says, in Job 32 verse 8, it is a spirit in man that gives them understanding. Likewise, the prophet Zechariah confirms that God, Zechariah 12 verse 1, forms the spirit of man within him. And Paul declares in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 that man has a spirit within him, a human spirit that gives man this unique human mind. For what man knows, the things of a man, except the spirit of the man which is in him. But anyway, caution is in order here because it is tempting for some who have believed in the immortal soul theory. It's very uh, 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 tempting for them to conclude that the spirit in man is merely another term for the immortal soul and that the whole argument is simply one of semantics. Not so. Not so. The spirit essence is not an immortal soul. The spirit in man is not the man. It is something in the man. It has no life of itself, for the life of a man is in the air that we breathe and in the food uh, that we eat and water we drink and in the blood that circulates that breath through our, our bodies. And we see that in Genesis verse 7 of chapter 2 and Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. So it does not itself see or hear for even a blind or a deaf person, though deprived of one of the centers, is altogether human still. And at death it has no consciousness at all, for it sleeps, as we know from 1 Corinthians 11 verse 30, from 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51, and from 1 Thessalonians verse 14 of chapter 4. Yet the spirit in man imparts the human qualities of mind to the man, you can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 through 12. And like a tape recorder, you know, forms a permanent record of the qualities of mind and character built by a man during his lifetime. And much as a used tape is stored lifelessly on a shelf till activated for use in recorder, so does the spirit of man return to God who gave it after death. Just like, you know, any, any, any CD burned you know, is there on the shelf until we activate it, you know, that's what it is. The spirit in man that goes goes back to God who gave it to humans will be activated at a certain time. And it remains with God until the resurrection life is again given to a person. We read about that in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. I don't quote these verse, verses because we have already we talked about what is death, the number one enemy of humankind. We quoted all of that. But those whom God has called and chosen, and they alone, they receive yet an additional component added to their makeup, if you wish. It is not the spirit of man, for man has that naturally and is in, and automatically. It is another spirit, the spirit of God himself, which is given to those who have been called and properly baptized with laying on of hands. And in Acts chapter 2, in the first New Testament Pentecost, you read uh, all that process that is described by the Apostle Peter. So the spirit beget, begets us spiritually. You see, that's another mystery that humans do not get. But I always ask humans, wait a second, cows give birth to the cows. Monkeys give birth to the monkeys. Cats give birth to the cats. 
cats dog give birth to the dogs and every every single created being after its own kind produces the offspring then what can be what can god give as an offspring can he give monkeys cats dogs you know just just logical question brethren can you know can god can god's children be like monkeys like 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 donkeys like horses like you name it obviously not what is born of the spirit is spirit says jesus christ to nicodemus so uh the spirit begets us spiritually much like a human is begotten physically in his mother's womb you have this uh, analogy in first peter let's go there to first peter to corroborate that so people would say oh what is he philosophizing well, i'm not philosophizing i'm just i'm just uh, i'm just quoting or, or or describing what is written in the holy word of god first peter chapter 1 and verse 3 blessed be the father and god the father of our lord jesus christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us here's the word begotten how could he beget us? If he is a spirit, how can he beget us? Can he beget us uh, spiritually or physically? Well, spiritually, obviously. Who has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, exactly. Brethren, once again, forget, don't forget this. Jesus Christ's sacrifice paid for our penalty penalty that, that, that we incurred with our sins but is jesus christ l living now is his resurrection through the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead that gives us eternal life brethren his life gives us life not his death it's his life can we once and for all just distinguish those things it's so important to distinguish it because the bible teaches us that it is so important but we have never paid attention to those little details, to those, lo to those little theological details, which to me, as far as I'm concerned, are terribly important. And I don't want us to be spiritual dummies, like I told you many times, just keeping the Sabbath and coming together on the Sabbath and the holidays. And oh, look how great we are because we keep the days that the world does not keep. No, brethren, I want us to be educated people because we're going to be the teachers in the world tomorrow. And many of you would tell me, but, you know, the church never taught. Yeah, I know the church never taught us that. Is that, is that the failure of, 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 of lay members of the church? Is the failure of the church, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not going to fail again, because we have no more time. Jesus Christ is closer than ever. And I'm going to fail. I'm not going to fail in that. I'm not going to fail you or anybody else. I'm not going to fail anyone. I want us to, indeed fulfill what the church government has been install, installed for. I believe that the church government is there to be serving those who are listening, who are learning, and who are to be the teachers in the kingdom to come. And I'm hoping that all of you who are just, you know, leaders in your churches and stuff will be teaching, having the same approach, teaching the people, because they were called friends we were called in this day and age before all the rest of humanity to become teachers and and priests and 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 and, and you know how, how can we be teachers and priests if we are not taught and if we are not trained in that knowledge now it doesn't doesn't make any sense to me so I want all the church government to be teaching all the church members those basic doctrines because understanding and knowledge of those basic doctrines first of all are going to protect each one of our members from possibly falling away from being baffled by these other doctrines that will come from who knows where and finally it's for the benefit of the rest of humanity because the rest of humanity then when the time comes for the rest of humanity to understand the truth the rest of humanity will have well-trained well-educated teachers well versed in the word of god who can then pass on that knowledge to others and lead them to salvation that's the plan of god as far as i know well if it is the plan of god then let us let us make sure that we will uh, uh that we will fulfill that plan to the best of our ability 
So the Spirit of God joins with our own spirit. We read about that in Romans 8, verse 16 and 17, and provides provides both the fruits or qualities of God himself in us and the ability to understand not merely the things of man, but spiritual knowledge from God, which the rest of the world cannot understand. And that's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians, even though I'm just referring to all these other scriptures, that you are supposed to be like good disciples of Christ, taking notes of, and you can check for yourself, and you can just, if those who are called leaders, you can just develop it further in whatever message you want to, whatever good message, Bible-based message you want to give to your audience. You have to understand, friends, that we're just big dummies. We have so much lack of understanding of various things. We have lost in the past 38 years without the proper government of God. We have lost We have lost the, 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 the understanding, the grasp, the, uh, the knowledge of various basic things like preparation day, for example. And we have to restore it all now. We have to restore it now before the re return of Jesus Christ. And I don't care whoever thinks it's wrong or not. Let them convince me that they're right. What's it, and again, what is the purpose of us keeping the holidays and just the Sabbath and not understanding the basic Bible teachings? What's the purpose of that, you know? The purpose of that is just to, you know, Satan using our human nature to say, well, look how wonderful we are. Tap, tap, tap on the shoulders. Oh, great we are, aren't we? We keep the true days of rest and this whole deceived dark world keeps. Friends, that's not the point. I told you a million times and I'll say a million more times until you all get it. The Sabbath is a special covenant. <sighs> which many Sabbath keepers don't even know, those who keep the Sabbath. They don't even know that it's not only part of the Ten Commandments. No, the Sabbath covenant with the house of Israel was a separate, then separate, distinct covenant from the Old Testament. Meaning that that Sabbath, because it was signed for all generations of Christians, uh, all generations of Israelites, in all their generations, doesn't matter whether the Old Testament or the New Testament, the Sabbath was signed as a covenant signed between us and God, brethren. It's a sign to us that we are God's people. It's a sign to God that we're His people. Between God and us, not between the world and us. Do you get it? So it's our covenant sign, it's our covenant sign, but it pertains only to us, not to the rest of humanity. And if the rest of humanity doesn't even know we keep the Sabbath, it doesn't matter. Who cares? Because it's not signed, coming and signed between them and God. It's signed between us and God. So we can be keeping the Sabbath all the one, all, all the month that we want and just keep telling the world we keep the Sabbath, we keep the Sabbath. What does that mean to the world? The world doesn't have a covenant with God with that. The world doesn't have a covenant sign. And we can be saying, oh, we keep the Sabbath, but yeah, sure, uh, uh, your, your eternal life, where does it come? Oh, it comes from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Wrong, wrong. It's wrong because the Bible says that the sacrifice is releasing us from the death that we incurred. But that Jesus Christ's resurrection to life and his current life is actually the guarantee for us that we will live forever, brethren. That's, for example, here's one one little nuance in the doc in the doctrine, if you wish, if the if the if theology, if you wish. And that's why we have to go through all these basic doctrines and basic Bible theology, brethren, that we be educated, not we be dummies who keep the Sabbath, not even understanding what makes us and gives us eternal life. And we've lost so much in the last thirty-eight years. Those of us who are in, in, in whatever association with Herbert Armstrong, we have lost so much of knowledge and understanding. And there are various other Sabbath keepers that were never having touch with Mr. Armstrong, nevertheless, but they've just lost even more. Because the their theology is so heavy under the, oh, you know, because deep down we think, wait a second, all these many millions of Protestants cannot be that, that wrong. 
Oh, yes, they are death wrong and even worse, brethren. And we accepted their theology thinking, yeah, they must not be that wrong. So, yes, they are that wrong. That's why God raised the God's church, <coughs> the only true church in the world. To explain to the world and to itself and to its members what is a true theology. And it's time, it's the last time perhaps, we have no more time because Christ is coming back very soon. It's the last time that we finally discern discern and understand the true theology of the Bible. And that we stop believing all kinds of silly things or erroneous Protestant teachings that have nothing to do with the Bible. One of the best examples is Elijah and Enoch, you know. Enoch and Elijah, who supposedly came to, 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 to immortal life before Jesus Christ. Brethren, that's such a huge blasphemy. It's a blasphemy that you just do not understand how blasphemous it is. Because if he is the first one among the many brethren, then he has to be the first one. Nobody could be before him. But this world has proclaimed Enoch and Elijah, you know, Gaining immortal soul before, gaining immortal life before Jesus Christ. Brethren, that's horrible. Because they've just misunderstood the terminology of the Bible. That's horrendous. We must not allow ourselves to fall into that rut, into that deception. It's disgusting. It's anti-biblical. It's, 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 it's blasphemy against God. Brethren, do you understand that? But we are so careless about those things because we never stop to really think deeply about what we do. We never stop to really think, it's, is it really wrong to buy vegetables on the Sabbath or not? We don't stop to think, well, wait a second. The new moons will be kept in the world tomorrow because it says in the Bible. You don't believe me? Well, you go and read the book of Isaiah. Uh, I think it's chapter 60, 65 or 66. It's certainly in the two last chapters 65 and 66 and we don't stop to think well wait a second how do you, uh, how in the world uh, well we don't know but at least we can speculate how is jesus christ going to restore that we don't stop and we don't think why not brethren why not what is the, what, what is our brain there for us oh well the church will think for us no the church cannot think for you all the time the church may get struck and might be some of us might be dead and some of us might be in prison and some of us might be unable to serve you and then what's wrong what's wrong with you you have to use your brain to come to a certain conclusion the church was already once scattered in the past in the middle ages and was scattered and it was disunited but people People were just using the Spirit of God and their own minds to come to the right co conclusion about the doctrines. Sadly, many of those doctrines they did not understand until Herbert Armstrong came and wrote, you know, and, and restored all those lost doctrines or most of the lost doctrines or, you know. But isn't there some more things that we need to dis restore? Yes, we need to restore good practice. Perhaps not even doctrines, but good practice. But even the doctrines, because many people did not understand the basic doctrines, brethren. And among those people, many who did not understand were all of us, starting with me. And I realized what a failure that is. It's a huge failure. Because the priests, you're going to be my priests and my kings, the priests in that age... When Jesus Christ, uh, as the God of the Old Testament, led Israelites out of Egypt, he says, you're going to be my priests. The priests were the most educated, the most knowledgeable, and the only literate people in the world. What does that tell you about us? Are we not supposed to be all that today in this world? Yes, we are. How are we going to be that if we're not taught the right thing, if we don't use our brain, our common sense? That's how important it is. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, it says, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? So we have the spirit of the man in us. That's what the Bible reveals. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. All right. However, 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who? Uh, the spirit who is from God, or what is from God, which is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So we are free. But we are free not because of our own merit or because we have done something so uh, incredible. No, no, no. We have received the Spirit of God. So further, brethren, once we become converted and are filled with that Spirit, we have the seed and down payment of eternal life with us, which, unless rejected later by us, will indeed blossom into full eternal life at Christ's return, as we read in first. Sorry, this is now Second Corinthians chapter five verses 1 through 5. You read it in your own free time. And if you haven't recorded it, taking notes, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. So that spirit, if unless we reject it, is going to blossom into the full eternal life at Christ's return. So fi finally, how incredible that we are, we mere humans, we may have within us the mind of God and the very knowledge of God. Isn't that amazing? Yes, it is amazing. Isn't that what man is? Yes, that's what man is. Isn't that something that God has in store for us, the eternal life, in full, total understanding and, 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 and knowledge of all the things? Yes. So in conclusion, the incredible and true picture is now complete. Man is not an animal, nor an immortal soul housed in a fleshly body, but man is rather a totally mortal being but with a spiritual component, the spirit in man, which gives him the power of conscious human mind and free will, and which couples with God's Holy Spirit to form the converted Christian mind. And yes, that man, that poor man that looked like elephant, John Merrick, the elephant man was right. Neither he nor the rest of us are animals, but rather human beings made in the image of God with the hope of eternal glory. That's, brethren, what is a man. That's what the Bible reveals to us what man is.